But what does business want to hear from the Liberal Democrats and from Danny Alexander? Well, I'm joined by uh, John Cridland from the CBI. And what do you want Mr Alexander to say that would give business a boost? I'd like Danny Alexander to champion the fact that it's business that is delivering the recovery, not any of the politicians, and that it's a sustainable, broad-based recovery. To the man and woman on the Glasgow omnibus, it won't feel spectacular because it isn't spectacular, but we are moving upwards, and I'm pretty confident that is going to sustain. I was just talking about uh, Vince Cable and how he's been perceived as speaking out of turn. One of the things he has warned about is the danger of a housing bubble, and he's been very critical of this help-to-buy scheme launched by the coalition. How serious is the threat, do you think, of another housing bubble? I'm a fan of the help-to-buy scheme, because only six months ago, at the time of the budget, all the politicians were demanding that government did something, almost anything, to get the housing market moving. And I don't think we are facing a housing bubble. We have London with international money, a world capital. Yes, there's house price inflation there, and we mustn't be complacent about the risk of house inflation. But heck, the housing market's so far below zero, it's right that we help young couples in solid jobs with good money get over the hurdle of not being able to pay the deposit for their first mortgage. That's the right thing to do. One idea that's been kicked around here is whether maybe the help to buy scheme should be restricted to areas where house prices aren't rising so quickly. In other words, it wouldn't be applicable in London. What do you think of that idea? Well, I think government doesn't have a very good track record of interfering in the market. When I helped government design help to buy, I was looking for a simple intervention. I'm not complacent about the housing bubble. Vince is right, we should pull back on support when it's no longer needed, when the market's functioning normally. But at the moment, I'd stick with it, because even in London, there are young people who don't live in Kensington and don't have international money who can't get a flat. OK, one other idea which has been mooted here is doing something about zero-hours contracts. Vince Cable has announced a consultation uh, into zero-hours contracts. Do you think you can get rid of them and what would be the impact on business? In the deepest economic crisis we've had in many, many years, two and a half million of our fellow citizens didn't have a job, currently haven't got a job. But most economists thought it would be at least three million, if not three and a half million. The reason it wasn't three million is because of things like zero hours contracts. The flexibility that meant people were keener to hang on to their job than increase their hours or their earning power. And I think workers made the right judgment. Now, where there are abuses on zero hours contracts, Vince talked about people saying, I've got no work for you today, but you've signed a piece of paper to say you can't work for anybody else. That's an abuse. I don't defend that. But that's not typically what zero hours contracts do. Most people on zero hours contracts tell us that they get as many hours as they want or need. So let's deal with the abuse without throwing the baby out with the bathwater. OK, John Cridland, uh, thanks so much. Jane, some cautionary words there on the zero hours contracts.